Welcome to this episode of Kennedy Saves the World. It's happy hour, and I'm so happy to have Benjamin Hall here. Um, Benjamin, I first met you, I think, in 2014, 2015. I interviewed you um, when you were going to conflicts all over the world. And, you know, many people obviously have heard what happened to you because of your incredible memoir, Saved which we have talked about. We've, we've done a couple of podcasts, one specifically about that, the other one about your podcast, which is phenomenal here at foxnewspodcast.com. But now Saved is in paperback. It is. It's out there. Um, I'm never sure how to sell it, you know, but I mean, it's easy to carry around. The messages are still in there. <laughs> the writing is fantastic. The story is almost unbelievable. I yeah. mean, still, I, I go back to your book constantly and I think about some of the things that you've been through and whenever I feel like I'm going through some sort of adversity, I think about the things that got you through. You know, this is... Um, and this is just diet root beer. Don't be afraid of it. Delicious. I'm going to yeah. ha mm -hmm. have a... First of all, can I say what an honor it is to be on your podcast? I, I need to give you a stir with the, with the fork. Oh, this. Benjamin, stop it right now. Anytime you're in New York, you stop by and Done. I will make you something delightful to wet your whistle. All right. Well, cheers. To you. And never being afraid. Well, and that's it. Look, this is the paperback oh, comes lovely. out this week. That's delicious. Mm -hmm. uh, paperback comes out, out this week, but it is also the second anniversary of the attack on wow. Thursday. And I think that that's kind of the message is mm -hmm. that, look, here we are two years on. Yeah. Terrible things happen. But you and I are sitting here lifting up a drink, yes. talking together. And I think that the only message you have to send out to people is that no matter how difficult things are, you can always get through them. Yes. You know, the last two years have been about that for me. And uh, I'm a firm believer now that inside every single person, there is the ability to get up when you have to get up. When yeah. you're against the wall, you can find extra strength. And so that makes the world a wonderful place when you realize that we, can, we all share that. Yeah, and I love seeing videos of your girls. Mm. And how is everyone adapting? You know, two years on, obviously, a lot of the book was written pretty close to uh, the event when you were essentially bombed by Russian drones in Ukraine. Yeah, and um, the, the book was really therapeutic because I was in hospital for almost eight months and um, it's very boring in hospital. Yeah. You've got to lie in an ICU bed. You can't move. And so writing and putting down my thoughts and remembering what had happened in detail was a real benefit of the mm. therapy for me. So that's what I started to do is to write about. It. And that was one big chapter. I got better. I learned how to walk. I got prosthetic legs. My patched me up with skin grafts all over from head to toe. And hours and hours of physical therapy. Oh, and that, four hour sessions. That continues to this day, to be honest. I'm still doing it. But that was a, w one chapter. And then I got home. And then as you asked, that was the next chapter. How have they adapted mm -hmm. to it? Because injuries like mine, and this goes out to anyone out there, it's not just you who's hurt. It's your family that's hurt. Yeah. And so many of the veterans who have been injured like I have have gone through something similar. And it's the pressure that it puts on their wife or their children who suddenly have to do a whole lot that they couldn't do before. Mm -hmm. So it is big and, and difficult for them. So you ask how the transition went for me, and I'm very, very lucky. My daughters are currently aged four, six, and eight, Honor, Iris, and Hero. Yeah. And my biggest worry when I was going home was how would they be affected? Yeah. Would they see me and take a step back and not want to hug me? Which does happen to quite a few people yes. I've heard. Um, no, they didn't. They've embraced me. They've been so open about realizing that there's some things I can't do, which I, which I, which I used to do. And uh, they've gone through an awful lot, but they've been brave and amazing about it the whole way through. So, and uh, have, have you been able to talk to other injured soldiers and veterans? And has that been helpful for you and for them? Many. It was the most important part of my recovery. I was treated in U.S. military medicine at the Brook Army Medical Center in Texas and San Antonio, which is a center that dealt with all the injured out of Afghanistan and Iraq. Mm -hmm. Injuries like mine are worse than mine. And the benefit of being there is that you're surrounded by soldiers who have gone through something similar. And within a few days of getting out of, of Ukraine, they were sending people around me, veterans who had similar injuries, to show me Look at me. This happened to me two years ago. And look what I'm doing. Yeah. And sending that message of positivity and optimism to, to people who need it is huge. And if there's one thing I'd like to do now, I reach out and I've been to hospitals and I've spoken to people who are injured like, like I was because I want to pass that on. Yes. Take one look and realize that it's difficult right now, but you're going to be doing just fine. Just yeah. push on through. And, and that's amazing because I'm sure there were times. I mean, I just think about you being transported in a dirty blanket mm. with tubes coming out of you mm. on the train trying to get out of Ukraine, trying to get to Poland. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure there were times where you're like, 
I don't know that I'm going to survive this. And it, it was it difficult to think of the long term where you are now, or is that what kept you going? Was it really just a minute to minute surviving every second, or was there the long term like I'm going to get back, whatever whatever's wrong with me, I'm going to overcome it? There was one thing and that is I'm going home to my children, yes. my wife. That was it. So I was on that train, you know, a couple of days till they managed to evacuate me, and I'm very close to dying, a lot of pain, no pain meds, and that's what I thought. Yeah. Whatever it takes, I'm going home. I'm going to see my children. And I never thought I was going to die. Um, I, uh, But I knew I was going to see them again. And as painful as it was, I just kept saying to myself, just keep going. Yeah. Just keep going. You're going to see them again. And look, you go through something terrible and it takes away all of the, you know, the things that normally bother in your life, yeah. the things that worry you. They wake you up at night, the worries that wake you up at night that you think are insurmountable they disappeared and it came down to one thing and it was getting home to seeing my wife and my children and yeah. boy was it simple and boy did it make life just seem so much easier and i still feel that today i actually find that life is easier today because i'm no longer concerned with the the nonsense that we worry about yeah concerned about loving my family being close to my family helping other people being part of a community hard work when you've got to work hard Put all those things together and you're going to have a wonderful, happy life. Did it make you, um, I don't know if you're a person of faith. Did you become a person of faith? Did it change your faith at all? I was a person. I, I grew up as a Catholic and I was at a Roman Catholic monastery, a Benedictine monastery from the age of nine, living with the monks. And so wow. I was raised, a, you know, a very strict Catholic. And then I kind of lost my way for a bit, you know, because I was covering conflicts around the world. And, I, and so I stopped going for a while. But I will tell you that when I was there, the car, we'd been attacked. The car was blown up. My leg was missing. I'm almost dead and I'm lying there. I thought, first of all, about my family and getting home. And the next thing I thought about was God. Oh. And I said, please, Lord, help me get home. Help me get home. Yeah. And so my journey with religion has been ups and downs, winding. Yeah. I've been so religious and I've walked away from it a bit. And now I'm actually a very... I feel quite spiritual. I still pop into church quite often, but I don't necessarily believe such in the established religion um, as I as I did. I just believe that there is a God and that we must be close to one another and do everything in the right way. And uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm still on that journey, yeah. to be honest. Well, that's interesting because it sounds like now it's unmediated. And now you have the courage to have an unmediated mm. relationship with God, which I think is fascinating. And, you know, you, you talk about people who were overcome with worry and anxiety and depression have shot through the roof yeah. since the pandemic. So what do you tell people? Like, what are some skills that people can incorporate to give themselves a little bit of perspective in their lives? Like, is it meditation? Is it is it externalizing your worries? What What, if people haven't been through what you've gone through, and very, very few people have and live to tell about it, what can they do in their lives to cope and overcome and get to this like it, it really is a blessing to be able to let go of all that mm. and just feel the stoke for life and, and like the pure love you have for your family yeah and i think it's slightly different depending on who you're talking to we've got to find something in everyone that they absolutely love and they feel reward in doing so and that's comes from uh, hard work for example you, you you have a dream and you go and you you try and achieve it but it doesn't mean you have to you don't look at the end goal you can sometimes look at the small things so you know, I speak to a lot of people who are anxious or, or depressed. And sometimes I say the first thing is just to, to stand up, to walk out the door, go for a little walk around the block, mm. clear your head, look at something that you might think is quite beautiful or gives you. And that could be a, a beautiful bird, a, sun, a ray of sunlight. And I don't want to sound too, too strange, but or, or a great piece of music and realize that no matter how th there are beautiful things out there and you've got to look for them and appreciate them and pick up the phone and call someone and tell them how you're feeling. You know, I learned that when I was in hospital. I grew up very, you know, sort of English and I didn't talk about my feelings. I felt I'll just get through it. But actually in hospital, I said to myself early, when I'm having a bad day, I'm feeling tough and it's not uh, feeling bad and it's not going well. I'm going to tell the first person that walks in that door wow, every that day. Helpful. Oh, my goodness. I never realized how just saying some of these things out loud to someone, you know, I'm having a difficult time or this is really painful. Or, I'm a bit lost. How am I going to get through this? Wow, you say it one time and it lifts something from you. And you say it a few more times, it lifts something. And I'm a real firm believer that if you're having a difficult time right now, just tell someone, say, hey, you know what? I just want to share with you that I'm finding it quite difficult right now and I'm just looking for a way through. That really helps. Yeah. Absolutely helps. And so it's about being together. And it works the other way around. If you know someone who's going through, so you think might be going through something difficult, ask them how they're doing. And if at the first time they say, yeah, fine, 
ask them again because they never tell you on the first time. Yeah. So it's about community, but it's about setting yourself some goals. And it's about realizing that you don't have to get to that goal immediately. Go step by step, do little things at a time. And they will lead you somewhere good. They always will. Um, so, uh, but I think you're absolutely right. Like people oftentimes sort of exist with this tortured conversation in themselves mm. that they don't externalize because, you know, either they don't want to burden other people with what they're feeling or they feel like it's not important enough. Mm. And, you know, those things aren't true. So I agree with you. Like it really is so important, especially like depression, anxiety, and then there's loneliness. Like we, a lot of people we forget and, you know, you, I, I think it's also a wonderful thing to reach out to people who might be silently suffering and also like lift them with things that are going well in your life as an example. Yeah. Loneliness uh, is really difficult. You know, you, I read a lot about, uh, about people who suffer from loneliness and it's so easily solved. It really is. It's just popping yeah. around to see them or see how they're going. But I also understand that it, the longer you go through something, the harder it is to get out. Yes, you know, the, that's the a long, good point. The longer you don't talk to someone or you stay at home, the harder it is to break through. And so, um, you know, if, if it's been a long time, realize that it's never too late. You might feel that you're at the bottom of a hole, but it's never too late. You know, sometimes just one spark can get you up, get you walking, and that one little spark can lead somewhere. Yeah. So even if it doesn't sound like it's very much, just do tiny, one tiny little thing, yeah. one small little thing, and then try something a little bit the day after. You know, when I was learning to walk again, it was always, if I can walk two steps today, I'm going to walk three steps a day after. Yeah. And it's one step. It didn't sound like much, but I always just knew. It's 50% more. Well, I was going to do one more, one more thing the next day that I hadn't done that the, the day off. And that can be as small as, you know, cleaning up one room in your house if it's dirty uh, or whatever. But small things, just try and improve, try and make things a little bit better. Do you, do you get that itch to travel and cover stuff in faraway places? Oh, absolutely. It's one thing that I... I was bred on, you know, and it's, it's part of my career forever. And very soon after this happened, I was already talking about getting back to Ukraine and reporting and covering it again. And it was a long discussion with my wife about it. But back in November, I was back in Ukraine. Yes. And then a few weeks ago, I was back in Israel. And of course, I've had these discussions with my wife and people think it's crazy that I'm going back. I'm not running around the front lines anymore, but, you know, there's certainly war zones uh, that I've been in. And I think more than anything, I, I feel very strongly that I was a journalist who was attacked and who they tried to effectively silence and we were knocked down and I won't let them silence us. Good. I won't let Russia, you know, try and stop the news coming out. And so even it's just me, I felt very strongly about going back and saying, we won't stop. We know what happens in wars. That's what I chose to do. and We won't stop because of the dangers. So uh, I, I've got that drive and I plan to keep going back um, to keep telling these stories because I think more than ever, I think news is absolutely essential. Don't go anywhere. More Kennedy saves the world right after this. How has it informed your reporting? Obviously, your mobility might be different, but is your reporting different? It's a really interesting question. I am um, back in Israel a few weeks ago. For the first time, I had a couple of interviews where I really felt the emotion, which I never used to before. I interviewed this one the girl was 21. She was kidnapped from a music festival. She was held by Hamas for 54 days. She had a leg blown, a foot basically shot off, couldn't walk. And I, and I interviewed her. And it was the first time in my whole career that I left an interview with a real sense of, just felt like it really hit me. And I felt the emotions and her emotions, which in a way I never did before as a journalist. And I, so I think I'm a better journalist now. I feel that. Mm before I was reporting what was happening, but I maybe wasn't being able to convey perhaps what was meant. And it's not for me to do that as a journalist, but I only realized it a few weeks ago when I did that interview. And I interviewed someone who lost their whole family, including kids, age of my kids. And I felt something I'd never felt as a journalist before. Uh, and uh, I think life is about learning things and I've learned something and I'm grateful for that. And uh, um but it was interesting. I've never felt that way before. So it's definitely, I actually wonder whether it changed me in a big way. And that was the moment I realized, wow, it has changed me. I would never have felt that way afterwards. Well, maybe you would have fought against it. Oh, out, it out of, out spot of on. fear, you might have fought against. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Instead of realizing that perhaps you can embrace it, realize this and then grow from it, you know, don't run away from it. Face up to things that might seem hard. Face up to, uh, you know, interviews that, that are going to be, tricky like that yeah. yeah but i mean how how great that you now have a new dimension 
in what you do, mm. which I'm, I'm sure wasn't something that you foresaw when you were going through it, but emerging on the other side and having like, not just rationality um, and y- y- not just intuition, but the feeling as well, you know, that, that raw feeling, because it really makes what you do so much more multidimensional. Yeah. I'm a firm believer that I've learned a lot and I've come out the other side stronger. You have to, um, no, no matter what you go through, learn from it. Yeah. Come better from it. And, uh, Keep moving and just never stop moving. I've recommended your book to so many people. The audio book, uh, the hardback, the paperback. Like people need to read the story. Um, it's it's so compelling. It's beautifully written. I know you got another book you're working on. <laughs> I am. I'm writing you <laughs> out at the moment. It's uh, it's uh, It won't come out till next year, but it's. Um, I'm just feeling inspired right now. Not just my story, but about resilience. And I sometimes ask, what is it that allowed me to get through this doing so well and find optimism and other people not to find that. And of all the doctors I've spoken to, you know, they say patients go in two directions. You have half who come out like I've come out of it mm. with this absolute joy for life. And you realize how lucky you are and you never waste another second of your life. And yet the other half who come out of it really badly, who lose their identity, they lose uh, their character. And I've been really trying to find out what makes a difference, mm. who comes out of it with optimism, who doesn't. And, um, you'll have to read the book to find out. Yes. But I will tell you the one thing that most of my doctors say, because I'm still figuring it out myself. The one thing that allows most people to come out of it positively are those who are surrounded by a community mm. and a family. That's it. And I was asking, is it the way they do their rehab? Is it their doctors? No. It's those who come from a close-knit family, who have a community around them. They're the ones who come through it well, above everything else. Well, I can't wait to read your next book. I, I love... Your reporting, and uh, I will stay deeply inspired by your story and your family. Thanks, Kennedy. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a just, pleasure to be here, and uh, you know, we all do it together. Yeah, I mean, it's it's wonderful it. to Teamwork. be able to talk to you because I remember people here were so worried. People who had never met you, they were so incredibly worried because we had so little news. So to be, to be able to sit here and you know have a mocktail with glasses with little French bulldogs, mm-hmm. it's a it's a blessing. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know. Uh, an aside, but Fox have been amazing. So I'm very lucky that I'm surrounded by people who have helped me talk about communities. I work in the best place. I'm surrounded by family who are the best place. I've been surrounded by everyone. So, you know, we've all been through it together and I appreciate everyone at Fox and I felt the support from everyone at Fox and that also helped. That's right, baby. Cheers to that. Cheers to that. What a pleasure. Saved. Buy it, love it, know it, give it away. Give it to someone. This has been Kennedy Saves the World along with Benjamin Hall. I'm Kennedy. Listen ad-free with a Fox News Podcast Plus subscription on Apple Podcasts and Amazon Prime members can listen to this show ad-free on the Amazon Music app. Oh, go ahead and leave me a review while you're there. I'd love to hear what you have to say. You've been listening to Kennedy Saves the World on the Fox News Podcast Network.